Hi, good morning. My name is Marco. I still work here. <laughs> I love that you laugh at that joke. Thanks so much. I work in uh, junior high ministry. I work with 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Things are going super well for us. Uh, we've moved back up into the upper room. We're about 70 to about 95 students in a week. Uh, if you think about us, which I hope you do, I, please pray for uh, my students, please pray for our students in this area, this community. Finals are coming up, end of the school year stuff. Got a lot of big plays, big theater stuff, big band stuff, all that stuff, man. It puts a lot of stress on our kids. Anxiety really ramps up this time of year. Pray for, if you've got a kid, ask them what's going on, check in with them, pray for them, pray with them, uh, help them finish up this school year real strong. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, I'm super pumped to be the guy that gets to open up a series. Heck yeah. I, the relational mayhem is something that I think is super important. I think it's maybe one of the most important things that I have to do in my job. I think my primary goal is to communicate the gospel effectively, but man, second, it, it all stems in this relationship stuff. Not Carson, but this relationship stuff. <laughs> relational mayhem happens everywhere. And even when I throw this topic out, you're already knowing where we're going to be covering in this series. We wanted to talk about all the different stages we find ourselves in in our really important relationships. We definitely should be talking about your friendships and that kind of thing, but this series is going to be handling those like romantic family type relationships. We're going to be talking about marriage and, and talking about what mayhem looks like in that position and dating and all those other places. But if we're going to get to those places, if we want to talk about them, we have to start where it starts. And today, we're going to be talking about this, the, the topic of singleness. And immediately, I can see it on many of your faces that there's this, like, negative-ish connotation to it. There's, like, this, like, weird negative we feel about singleness. Like, there's something wrong with the single person. There's something just not quite there. You may be privy to the fact that I'm married. I've been married for four years. I love my wife a lot. I have a five-year-old niece. She's my niece that I take care of. She's basically mine. You may be wondering, Marco, why are you teaching on singleness? I'm not sure. Ask Errol. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I know why I'm here. I'm here because I've got, if, if you actually looked at it, if you looked at my top closest friends, the people I spend the most time with, it's really only like two of them that are married, and they're not married to each other. A lot of my close friends, a lot of people my age are just prolonging that or, or just existing in this singleness space. And I was just so excited to be the guy that was going to go around. I wanted to talk to all these people. I wanted to get their feedback. I wanted to be a voice for these people. I was so excited to do that because singleness is just something we feel weird about. It's just something that is maybe not talked about in the best way or it's hardly talked about in the church at all. And when we really look at how many of our people find themselves in this category, it becomes really surprising. I went to some of my friends and I wanted to hear straight from them. What are some of your thoughts? I talked to some people who are here in this church who are single or have been single for a long time. I talked to people in surrounding churches and I talked to someone who wasn't even a part of a church who's single. Here's, I wanted to show you what some of these people are saying. Here's what my good friend John, John Keeley is a youth pastor in Bourbon A, is one of my close friends. He interned here for a while. He said this, he said, I felt pressure to get married in ministry so I wouldn't make parents feel uncomfortable. He's 24, he's not married. He works in junior high, middle school, he works in middle school, high school, and college age students. And he tells me all the time about how weird he feels working with college age students and how uncomfortable it sometimes make them feel. John doesn't feel weird about it. He's fine with it. He's whatever. My, he, my marital status has nothing to do with my ministry, but for some people, it's just better if a youth pastor is married. When I got married, I got married right before I accepted this position. It was like kind of a shotgun sort of a thing. People were like, wow, that's a good thing you're getting married. Like, whew, sigh of relief. You won't have those issues in ministry. That's weird, right? That's like a weird thing to say. That's a weird sentiment for John to feel. That's weird. It's just weird. Or what about this? Another one of my close friends, one of my besties. She said, we treat marriage as a necessary component to being a whole person. 
Like, like if I'm not married or if I don't have that significant other, there's a piece of me not present. Like I'm 85% Marco without my wife. That's weird. Single people in our church feel like I have to get married if I want to be my complete self. And people who are in this room and, and you're married, you, you know this to not be true. No way. I'm a whole person and my wife is a whole person and together we come together, but it has nothing to, like, my marital status shouldn't impact me as a whole person. I think this is a weird sentiment. It's just weird, right? Or lastly, I have a close friend who I went to Moody with. This is how she feels. I feel like I've let people down because I don't want to get married. I'm not interested it's something that I've just, yeah, I get that other people want to, and sure, I think it would be cool, but it's just not for me, I don't think. And then that disappointment that she feels. I've heard from her and talking to her mom and like breaking the news to her that she's maybe not interested. It was really heartbreaking for her mom. And even if you are single in this room and you want to get married, I know you felt this disappointment. Like I'm letting the people down in my family. I come from a Hispanic household. Man, we are all about this like marriage pipeline. It's all about get married, have babies, like a lot of babies too, you know? I'm 25, been married four years. I don't have any kids yet. My grandma is like waiting, waiting, waiting. She's got some medical problems, but she's hanging on because I gotta get that first grandbaby, right? You're all shaking your heads, you agree, yeah. Right, yeah. Makes complete sense. And I just think this, like these sentiments are weird. Church, I think this is important for us to look at. This is the message being received. Is that the message we wanna send? Is this actually how we feel about this stage in someone's life? Better yet, is this the message Jesus wants us to be sending? Is this how the Bible discusses singleness? Because let's be real, singleness is where we all start. I was born a single dude, I wasn't married. For 21 years, I, I wasn't married. A solid majority of my life, I was single. It's where all of us begin. It's, a, it's something we will all participate in, even if it's for a little bit. And to be even more fair, it's where a lot of us are gonna end up. We say that 50% of marriages end in divorce. That's pretty accurate. It's like a little lower, it's like 45 to 47%, depending on who you ask. But roughly 50% are ending in divorce. That's two single people created right there. Do we want them feeling ostracized in our pews? Do we want them feeling like they don't fit in? I don't think so. What about the widow or the widower? An, an unfortunate reality, it happens, people die. Do we want them feeling left out? I don't think so. I don't think we wanna ostracize or push these people out. I don't think it was our intention. I don't think it was our goal. But I think the way that we communicate about marriage, the way we really lift it up, and the way that we romanticize what it is and what it looks like, and, and then things like Hollywood and social media contribute to those things, but we're missing out on a whole demographic of people. Pew Research says it's almost 40% of US adults who are single. The number is actually like 38%. 38% of US adults are single. Church, and we're just pushing them out. One of my friends who I talked to who's not a believer, does not go to church, he's never been interested, I asked him about this and he says, I feel like I shouldn't go to church because it's for families. Churches are for families. It's all about the kids. It's all about the marriage ministry. It's all about that pipeline. Date, marry, have babies. We as Christians push that pipeline. I went to Moody Bible Institute. We call it Moody Bridal Institute. It's all about getting married and finding that specific person. For the record, I met Alex before Moody, okay? But it's just, how do we, how do we care for these people? 
How do we show them the gospel in an effective way? Church, I think it's our job to welcome people in and make this space comfortable for everybody. And 40% feel like they may be being left out because they don't fit the mold. We definitely need to change the way we talk, the way we think about this issue. If you're sitting in the pews and we ever talk about singleness, you should be like that kindergartner who knows the answer for the first time. You know what I'm talking about? They're like, well, Marco, Jesus, duh, Jesus was single. So, right? And Paul, those guys were single. You're absolutely right. And when we look at what these two guys had to say about the issue, when we talk about what was going on in their culture, the way that the culture viewed marriage, it's actually really interesting. Jesus is talking about the issue in Matthew chapter 19. He's arguing with some guys. They're getting into it. They're arguing and talking about divorce. And they're talking about how terrible divorce is. You see, in our Bibles, it talks about divorce pretty negatively. It always uses like bad language, like don't do it, God hates it, stuff like that. But it also has plenty of avenues for justifications for divorce. Don't, don't think that the Bible isn't privy to that also. But even in this culture today, we feel this negative push against divorce. Dude, in Jesus' time, the push was even stronger. Not in their Bibles, but in other cultural texts, we can see that they just really wanted you to get married. Like, not a command, but you really should, you know? And if you're not, you're kind of like failing your family and God. And so it was just this like really aggressive push. Divorce is bad, bad, bad. And so the people are talking to Jesus about this. And like, divorce is the worst, right? He's like, yeah, it is the worst. And then they're like, well, Jesus, loophole, what if nobody ever got married? What if we just never did the marriage thing? What if we were just all single for the rest of our lives? And this is Jesus' response, direct quote. He says, not everyone can accept this word. Not everyone's going to be able to be single for a lifetime or be single for a, a long period of time, but to only those to whom it has been what? Given. Jesus' language is intentional, and it's certainly unique. To whom it has been given, it is singleness. Jesus, the way he's talking about it here is he's saying that, that person who is single whether it's for a period or for it's, uh, whether it's for a lifetime, that's a gift. It's something he got, he, he's offered to us. Our God is so generous. He is all generous. He's all generosity. All he wants to do is give. And one of the gifts he gives is what? Singleness? What about Paul? Paul is like your quintessential answer. If you ever talk about singles, you've got to bring up Paul. You've got to bring up this passage, 1 Corinthians 7. Paul nails down. He's talking about marriage and divorce. The book of 1 Corinthians is great. He's just yelling at them all the time. And in this book, one of the things that he's yelling them about is uh, wives and husbands are like withholding sex in their marriages. They're just like abstaining from it and they're making it like a weapon and they're just using it in ways that God didn't intend. And so Paul is talking about this and he's like, marriage is a huge gift. It's a beautiful thing God intended for this to happen. It's a beautiful picture of what uh, our relationship looks like to him. It's marriage is the best. But Paul says, I wish that all men were even as I myself am. Paul, when he's writing this section in 1 Corinthians, he's a single dude. According to our Bibles, we don't have any mention of Paul's marriage. Uh, it doesn't mention it specifically, but from a couple of context clues, we can sort of figure out that Paul was probably married at one point in his life. He gets to vote at the Sanhedrin, at like the political thing, and you typically couldn't do that if you weren't married at one point. And so Paul gets to do that. So we, we know that Paul understands the married position, but he also understands the single position. And Paul says, I think it's better to be single. I wish everyone was. However, Paul concedes, fine. Each man has his own gift from God, one this way and another that. I understand, Paul says, that you have this great desire to be married. And that's not a negative. God gave that to you too. That's a gift too. I believe that God's plan for my life was to be married to my wife. I don't think God's plan for me was to be single. 
for sure, not right now. But this idea that singleness could be a gift. He says, but to the widows, where's that at? But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, that it is what? Good, crazy. Nobody feels this way. If you told your mom or your grandma that you wanted to be single, she's not gonna respond by saying it's a good thing. We feel weird about it. But here's Paul saying, it's good for them to remain even as I. But Paul says, fine, if you don't have self-control, go get married. He kind of like throws it in as like a concession. Fine, go, you know, go get married. I totally understand. But Paul's understanding is, this is a gift. It is a unique opportunity. Church, plain and simple, singleness is a gift. Handed directly from God, handed straight from him. When I was talking to my friend, John Keeley, I'm on the phone with him, and I'm talking to him about being a young single pastor in his church, being a young single pastor here in this church for a little while, and he's, he's going off, man. He's like yelling on the phone. He's a real passionate dude. He's like, man, I just feel like we're letting all these people down. I felt so left out. I felt so ostracized and all these things, but on the flip side of that coin, he's also saying, he's like bragging to me. He's like, do you understand how much youth ministry I get to do right now because I'm single? Do you understand? He's like bragging to me. John's going to a, a, like his third Cubs game this week with like 12 of his kids, right? He just, he never has to consult his wife. He doesn't have one. He just gets to go. He just gets to serve. He gets to stay up late with his friends. He gets to be, like he gets to do all of these things. I don't get to do that. I've got to pick up Addie from school. I have to be there for my wife. I have to constantly balance this for the rest of my life as a pastor. I'm gonna be balancing this ministry and family thing. And you've seen many pastors fail at this. Church, that's not just for the pastorship, that's for all of us. We're all balancing this thing of how much am I giving to the ministry that God has called me to and how much am I giving to my family? And I totally understand that your family is definitely a ministry call. God wouldn't have given you your family on accident. He gave them to you on purpose. The ministry you're supposed to perform there is no less important than outside, but still, right? We balance. I lose out. I think of my close friend, Jacob Morgan, my, my mentor, one of my prime mentors in life. He's married now. He has two beautiful children. But before he got married, I'm just so thankful for all of the ministry he performed in my life. Countless late nights, countless drives up to Chicago in the middle, just whenever. I'm so thankful that Jacob was able to do that for me and was there for me in that way. And it was because he understood that his singleness at that stage in his life was a unique opportunity. A great gift for him to just be all in about Jesus. Just give it all to the ministry of the gospel. Church, I think my takeaway is this. I, wherever God has you, wherever God has you, be an opportunist. I think this is gonna be a great takeaway for the whole series moving forward. We're gonna be talking about dating and marriage and, and kids and the relational mayhem that happens in those, but I think this sentence is just gonna remain true throughout. Wherever God has you, if you're married, be an opportunist. Look for the best opportunities to serve God. But man, if you're single, you've got to see that this is straight from God, given to you, and it's an opportunity. I'm not a very business-minded person. I kind of despise people who are, actually. But one thing I really respect, one thing I really respect about the business-minded person is this opportunistic attitude. This like always on the lookout for like how to make the most money. I think that's great. I think that's an attitude that we should adopt, a mindset that Christians should adopt. I want, to be, I want us playing zone defense. Where can I be the most effective in my current stage of life? And man, if you're single, you're just given that opportunity way more than anybody else. Singles, I know it's gonna to be tough. You're gonna to have to make sacrifices just like everyone else. I make sacrifices in my marriage. People make sacrifices with their kids. I mean, a kid is like, having a kid is a huge sacrifice. You're not like, you're, you're just like us. Singles, you're gonna feel lonely in your singleness. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Just like everyone else. 
A marriage or a dating relationship isn't gonna solve that issue. Those things are still gonna be present. Married people feel lonely. People with 100 kids feel lonely too. I don't know about 100, but you know, right? They still feel lonely. You're gonna be, you're gonna let somebody down. You're gonna be a letdown. I'm, I disappoint people. I disappoint my wife, I disappoint Addie, I disappoint my parents, all those things happen, even though I'm married. And singles, lastly, you're gonna feel pressure to get married. You're gonna feel pressure to just rush down that pipeline, but guess what, so are all of us. I don't have a kid yet, and my grandma is like, man, you gotta do it. We all feel that pressure. Singles, the, the, the gift God has given you isn't as ostracizing or as separating as you may think. I, I think this is a, a, a unique opportunity for singles, but it's also a unique opportunity for married people. Do you think God created us this way where we would have married people in the church and single people in the church on purpose? Yes. Why would he do that? It's so that we, we could work together. We could lift each other up. Single people, I'm asking something from you. We need you. Us married people need single people in our lives, in our communities, in our churches to remind us of the blessing we've been given. Marriage is a huge blessing. But if 50% of them nearly are failing, maybe we're, us married people are missing out on it, on how much of a blessing it is. Singles, you can offer that to us. You can encourage us. And married people, we've got to get way better on the other side of that coin too. We can remind them. We can be there to encourage them when they're feeling like they're lonely or when they're feeling like they have to make sacrifices. When we go through these, those quotes from my friends, when they feel those emotions, it's our job as married people to say, I understand and I feel your pain, but man, you've got to view this differently. Go out there and serve Jesus completely. When we look at guys like Paul, who was able to do that later in his life, who was able to just give it all to Jesus, Paul goes on like four missionary journeys. He travels all over uh, the Middle East, just spreading the gospel completely. He's the most famous missionary in history. Do you know who wasn't doing all those things? Peter, because Peter was married. He stayed at home. He ran the church at home. He never went out. He couldn't. It was a slight disadvantage. Paul would call it a slight disadvantage to be married. Singles, we need your help. Married people, we've got to help our friends because the most important thing to remember in all of this relational mayhem is that nothing is permanent. Singles, your singleness may not be permanent. It may be for a short time. God may have that person ready for you and he's just waiting for the right time. His timing is perfect, his plan is perfect and when it happens, you'll say it was perfect. But church, even if you're one of those people who's single for your entire life, newsflash, not permanent either. Revelation 19 is so clear about what's gonna happen to us one day. One day I'll be sitting in front of this huge table. A bunch of you will be there too. Huge table. And we'll have this amazing food, massive feast. We'll be celebrating this amazing event. And what we'll be celebrating is our marriage. Our wedding ceremony to Jesus. Us, the church, we are his bride. He's building our house. He's just building and working on it. And, and one day we will be married to him forever. Married people, guess what? Your marriage isn't permanent either. What you signed up for was till death do us part. And you're gonna die. And when that happens, that marriage is over and you get to transition into an eternal marriage with Jesus. Nothing in our relational status is permanent. If it's not permanent, then why not use it to the max, to the max? Church, wherever God has you, especially in your singleness, be an opportunist. Look for those opportunities. Give it all up. I promise you that if you do, God is gonna be so faithful to reward that. He's gonna give you fulfillment beyond anything any person or marriage could offer. And married people, we've got to work too. 
and making sure that our marriages don't fall into that, where we're just idolizing this and making this the answer because that kind of language is pushing some of our friends away. Church, we've just got to change our whole mindset on this issue. We've got to understand that we're all here on the same team, that we want the best for our friends, that we want the best for our kids, we want them to be happy and successful and and feel all the great things we've experienced, but church, sometimes according to God's plan, that isn't in a marriage. But we've just gotta trust that he knows best for us. Wherever it is that you're currently at, go crazy. Give it all to Jesus and watch and see how he rewards that. He is faithful and generous to do so. Church, let's pray and let's ask God for help. God, there there is no one like you. You are the only thing that, that, that satisfies our needs. God, we are a needy people and we want and we want and we want. And God, time and time again, we just learn that what we want ultimately comes from you. God, we admit our mistakes in talking about this and and pushing people away, making them feel uncomfortable. Even if it was unintentional, God, these are how our friends feel. God, we, we ask that you forgive us for that. And not only you forgive us, but you help us, you push us in the other direction. Give us the wisdom to help our single friends understand the opportunity they've been given. Help us to understand how beautiful our marriages are and and how much of a gift that is. God, help us to just be an opportunist for the gospel. No matter where you have us, God, we just wanna give you all the glory. It's your generosity that allows us to keep going. We just wanna pay it back. God, we're so thankful for what you've done for us. We're so thankful that one day we will be married to you forever. God, I ask that you help us get there. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hey, church, it was great to see you. Have a great day.